welcome to Power Electronics. We are in week four, and this week we're going to look at the DC to DC converter. This is going to be the first part of a two-part sequence, an A and B sequence on the puck converter. And this material comes from uh, an application report from TI. Uh, the, the title of the application report is Basic Calculations of a Buck Converter's Power Stage, and it's by Bridget Hawk. I will link down to it in the description of the video, so go ahead and I encourage you to download this app report because it will provide more depth or details to the material I'm providing here. Let's look at an overview for this Part A segment. In this Part A segment, we're going to provide a block diagram of the DC to DC buck converter. We'll derive the equations that relate the input to the output voltage. And I'm going to tell you right away, it's a very simple equation. The output voltage is equal to the input voltage times the duty cycle. So if you put that one to memory, uh, you'll be really good. We're going to derive the design equation for sizing the inductor. Let's look at uh, the, the block diagram or a schematic diagram of the buck converter. And in this diagram, you'll see we have an inductor, a capacitor, and two switches. We have a high side switch, and we have a low side switch. We're going to assume that the output voltage is constant, and we're also going to assume we have a constant output current for the buck converter. And the way the buck converter works is let's assume we have a duty cycle, and let's assume our duty cycle is 75%. The high side switch will be closed 75% of the time, and the low side switch will be closed 25% of the time. We'll switch back and forth 75%, 25%. And as that happens, current will flow through the inductor, providing the current to the output, and will also provide a filtering with the capacitor. We'll create a ripple current through the inductor. Let's look at the equations that govern the buck converter. In this diagram of, of the switching arrangement, you can see that we have a node voltage that I defined right here, V sub A. And V sub A represents the switching voltage due to our duty cycle. So assuming we have a duty cycle of capital D uh, and a switching period of T sub S, we can look at the voltage across the inductor. The voltage of the across the inductor, VL of T, is equal to the node voltage VA of T minus the output VO. And I show the, the voltage across the inductor plotted over here. One of the things you'll notice about that voltage is its average value is equal to zero, which means that the average current that will be flowing through the, the inductor will be constant. It will, ne and it will neither be gain, uh, going up or going down. So we will get an average current flowing through the inductor. Recall the voltage across the inductor is L di dt. And we can then take the integral to find the current as a function of time. So I L of t is equal to 1 over L times the integral from 0 to t. We're doing real-time integration, so our independent variable goes up in the upper limit of our integral, times VL of x dx, where x is our, our variable for integration. And we have to also add our initial condition, and I'm going to call that initial condition I sub min. Let's further dive into this equation and plot the current of flowing through the inductor. So, so just from the past one, again, our current flowing through the inductor, I L of T, is equal to 1 over L times the integral from 0 to T, V L of X dx plus I min. 
Now, if we integ integrate over the voltage from, say, zero to DTS, we see we are integrating a constant value. And the integral of a constant value is a linear function. So it's, it's relatively easy to see that this integral, if we integrate all the way up to T equal D capital T sub S, will be equal to one over L, and I'll leave this as an exercise for you to, to prove this, V in minus V out, because that is the voltage, times DTS plus I min. So as we integrate, we start at I min and we go up to a value, which I'm now calling I max. And this value here is I max. When the switch opens back up in this position and this switch closes, we now drop our voltage across the inductor to minus V sub out. That will have the impact of basically, I don't want to say discharging, but the current will then ramp downward in the inductor. And we can use that if we start with our initial condition of I max, we can get an equation for I min. I min is equal to one over L times the voltage across the inductor, which is minus V out right there times the time of integration, which is going to be one minus the duty cycle because this, this, this period of time is one minus D times TS plus the initial condition, which is I max. Now these two equations are going to be used to help us get both the, uh, uh, an e a design equation for L and the relationship between the input and the output duty cycle. And let me just fill in our current graph over here. It'll go up and it'll go down. On the past slide, we derived these equations. A couple of things now to look at, and I would like to define first this difference between I max minus I min as the ripple current. And I'll call it delta, delta I sub O. And it's equal to I max minus I min. Again, this is the ripple current that is flowing through the inductor. And earlier, as I said, the inductor is always in continuous conduction mode. It never stops conducting current. Once we have this defined, we can, we can obtain an equation from both of these for I max minus I min. And from the top equation, we see that I max minus I min is equal to one over L, VI minus VO times D T sub S. We can also obtain an equation for I max minus I min or our ripple current from the lower equation. And I'm going to set that equal to the upper equation. The lower equation provides us one over L. And now I change the sign on VO because I put that on the other side of the equation times one minus D times TS. We can solve this equation. We notice that one over L's drop out, the TS drops out. And this provides us that VI times D minus VO times D is equal to VO minus VO times D. And here again, we see that this will drop out, which leaves with us with the final result that VO is equal to D times VN. 
So we can control the output voltage across the load by modifying the duty cycle. So for example, if our input voltage was say 50 volts and we wanted our output voltage to be 10 volts, we would need a duty cycle of 10 divided by 50 or 20% to make that happen. Let's now look at how we obtain an equation for the inductor. The value of the inductor we select will be determined by the switching frequency and by the amount of ripple current that we will allow. We can find that value of the inductor by solving for this equation. So let's uh, solve that in terms of the ripple current. Recall the ripple current delta I out is equal to the maximum value minus the minimum value. It is this value right there. And I'm going to use this lower one and we can see that that is equal to one over L times V zero times one minus D T sub S. We can solve for the inductor using this equation and we see that L is equal to V sub zero times one minus D. And now I'm going to substitute one over the switching frequency for the switching period. times delta IO. That equation is fine. Another equation that can be used is also an equation based on the load resistance. And one other way that we can write this is to look at and rearrange this equation to get the inductor value in terms of the ripple current as a percentage of the average output current. And I will do that by dividing both the numerator and the denominator by I sub zero, the average output current. That might be my favorite form of, of the value for the inductor. And just by looking at this equation, there's a couple things you can see. If we want a smaller inductor, we can always increase the switching frequency, F sub S. Going with a higher switching frequency will allow us to use a small inductor and still obtain the same amount of ripple current. As I said, I like this lower one because oftentimes in a specification for a buck converter, you will be given that the ripple current cannot exceed the average current by 20% or you're only allowed 20% of ripple current. And once, once that is given to you, we can put that into that form right there. Let's recap. So in this video, we presented that block diagram of how to put together a buck converter. It was more of a schematic with switches. We will be putting MOSFETs or BJTs or IGBTs into those high switch locations. We had some assumptions. The first is we assumed that the output voltage was constant and we assumed that the average output current was also constant. We also assumed that our inductor was in a continuous conduction mode, also called CCM. 
And by doing that, we obtained an equation that related the output voltage to the input voltage, which was the output was equal to the duty cycle times the input. And then finally, we obtained an equation for the sizing of the inductor, and we saw that the size of the inductor, L, was equal to, and usually you're going to specify an inductor that is slightly larger, we saw that that was equal to the load resistance times one minus the duty cycle all over the switching frequency times the ripple current or the change in ripple all divided by the average current. And that's just one of different forms of that equation for the inductor. And we can adjust the inductor size or the ripple current based on our switching frequencies. So that's part A. In the next part of this sequence for the videos, we're going to look at how to size the capacitor that was in the topology for the buck converter. And that capacitor is going to uh, adjust the, the, the ripple voltage across the load. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in part B.